Good afternoon and welcome to our forum this evening, our Dialogue for Development Forum, where we will be looking at the global state of organizational excellence. We want to thank you um, for joining us and appreciate that you, I know, I mean, afternoons could be a bit difficult, but we can certainly assure you that this is going to be quite an intriguing presentation and we will be open for uh, comments, questions, um, towards the end of the session. My name is Jerry Blenman. I'm the Executive Director of the Caribbean Center for Organizational Excellence and host for this afternoon's forum. Since 2015, Organizational Excellence Specialist, a Canadian-based entity, has been leading a large volunteer global research study to capture the current state of organizational excellence by size, industry, sector, and region. Intended to provide benefits for the excellence community in general and the working population at large, the study has identified the extent to which organizations have a culture committed to excellence and have deployed best management practices common to high performing organization. This webinar features the aggregate uh, results from the most recently published report, which is in 2023 with close to 3000 respondents. Um, we are delighted that you are a part of this, and we are honored to welcome as well Don Ringrose to share with us the findings from this extensive area of research and give us a better perspective on the global state of organizational excellence. Don is the principal of organizational excellence specialist in Canada and has consulted to management in areas that positively contribute to organizational performance since 1984. She has worked across industry sectors with small, medium, and large organizations. Recognized by her peers with the Fellow Certified Management Consultant designation, and as a Quimpro Certified Qualitist, Dawn is currently on the executive team of the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee of QMD and ASQ, and as well on the board of the ISCM Foundation. With a passion for transferring knowledge, Dawn authored a turnkey toolkit for ex excellence professionals in 2010 that has the was designed to make the improvement journey a lot more simple, straightforward, time efficient, and cost effective. Today, the tool has been used by professionals in over 70, 70 countries in a unique global research study to train local professionals on nation building projects. We are really delighted to have Dawn share with us on this particular subject area. And with this, I want to welcome you, Dawn, and invite you to present and address this subject of the current state of organizational excellence and details of the Global Organizational Excellence Index results. Over to you, Don. Thank you very much, Jerry, for the kind introduction. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm uh, so excited about this study. It's really been a labor of love. And I was uh, back in 2015 when the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee had an idea you know, to do this. Uh, they asked me if I would do it because I had this automated assessment and reporting tool and an integrated uh, excellence model. And I really jumped at the chance, even though it was volunteer, because this had never been done before. And it's surprising, you know, because excellence models have been around since the late 1980s. And, and yet they didn't, you know, hadn't done this research to find out how everyday average organizations are doing. And so this gives us a view to that. So let me get started. I've got quite a few slides and I'm gonna go through them quite quickly. And I think we have ample time at the end to address any questions or have a good discussion with the audience. So this uh, global research study, we've, we've managed, uh, as, as Jerry indicated, to attract about 3,000 respondents, which is tough these days because people don't want to take the time to fill up you know, an assessment or a survey. So I feel, I feel quite very grateful that we've had this level of participation. And we've managed to get uh, a good cross-section across uh, roles uh, and uh, industry sector, 
um, different sizes of organizations, uh, different regions of the world. So I'm I'm really, really pleased with that. Um, and as indicated, it was first launched by the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee. And this is a group of individuals that are on the executive that represent different excellence models around the world. And at the time it was, uh, you know, supported uh, by uh, the ISO Technical Committee that oversees the um, ISO 9001 standard, uh, the International Academy for Quality and the Global Benchmarking Network. And then it was voluntarily led by, by my business. And I must say that the real rock stars in all of this are the volunteer research team. We probably had about 500 or 600 people from around the world reaching out to their connections and inviting them to participate in this. And with that, it's been a lot of fun, you know, working with these wonderful professionals around the world. And also it's enabling us to get a good cross section of the population as well. This is a picture of the model that's being used. This is this integrated uh, excellence model that pulls together information from the leading uh, excellence models that uh, first arrived back in the late 80s. And that's EFQM, Baldridge, the Canadian and the Australian models. And so it, it pulls all that information together. So we've got really good definitions of the principles and practices that are common to high performing organizations. But this goes one step further. And it provides implementation guidelines that are used by seasoned management consultants. Because uh, that's probably the most commonly asked question that we've ever received is the how-to question. You know, how do you do this or that? But here are the principles. Uh, there's nine principles that characterize uh, an organization that's got a commitment uh, to excellence. And this is running throughout the organization. And then there are nine key management areas where all the best management practices reside. And if uh, you're a micro size organization with just one to 25 employees, there are 51 practices. But if you're larger than that, there's 102 practices. So for those consultants in the audience or business advisory professionals, these 102 practices really cover uh, a lot of what we do in our areas of uh, specialty, and, and also in, in our general practice uh, and in our advisory services that we provide to, to organizations. And there's also good parallels with people that work in other professions too, like quality management professionals. They'll see a lot of the practices that they use in the work processes area, supply chain management professionals in the supplier and partners area and so forth. So it's really amazing when you look through it, just uh, how broad and deep uh, it is. So this automated assessment tool that uh, that we developed was uh, something that uh, makes it a lot easier to do this sort of work. And uh, it helps us gather the data and information, you know, from ratings and open ended comments. And then it helps us pull that information together in in reports, you know, whether the reports are for this study or or for client organizations that uh, we do work with. And uh, in, in doing this research, we tried to provide as many as incentives as we could for, for the public, uh, the responding public. We said, gee, download a copy of the Organizational Excellence Framework at no charge, you know. It's a good reference publication and uh, it's a good thing that you can refer to, to now and again. Uh, we said, see how your organization measures up to high performing organizations. See how it, it compares uh, to others. And, and so these are the sorts of things that, that we were able to do. And then, of course, we've been publishing each report that we've released on a web page. Uh, and we've been publishing it on the LinkedIn group for the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee as well. So we're really freely sharing the information because we want it to be of benefit to everybody. So again, this is the kind of data that's being collected. We always keep the respondent or the name of the organization uh, in, in confidence and we would never report individual data, but we do report aggregate data. So people get a sense of the current state of, of excellence. And uh, as I said, uh, we're, we're sharing their results on our webpage and also with the Organizational Excellence Technical Committee, but we've certainly published in a lot of very reputable newsletters as well, like with the Global Benchmarking Network and, 
and ASQ and, and so forth. And then we've had the opportunity to present at a lot of international conferences where uh, we've been invited to, to speak. And uh, the list is growing in, in terms of uh, the, the conferences. And so it's just been an absolute pleasure to be speaking with people around the world about this study and, uh, and, and they appreciating the benefit that it brings to them, you know, whether they work in the excellence area or whether they're part of our, our general population. But the study is really meant to benefit all stakeholders. You know, the excellence community, of course, that works with these models and in this area, but also the working population at large. Because one thing we know from the global research over the decades is that only 10 to 20 percent of the working population has ever heard about excellence models. And so this kind of introduces them to that and, and then informs them about something that can help them improve their performance because uh, these practices are tried and true. And there's tremendous research that's been done over the decades that really show that this, uh, you put these excellence models in place, it's a real formula for success. It's uh, basically as you implement the practices, um, you develop a culture that's committed to excellence, and then you go on to achieve exceptional results across a balanced system of measurement. So you can imagine what this does for individual organizations, what it could do in a, in a community, if you had a number of high performing organizations, what it can do in a country, there's all sorts of benefits that, that uh, do come out of it. And we're thinking that, gee, if we were really successful in doing this, this would enable all countries to participate in a more competitive and sustainable way in the, in the global economy. Because as we know, you know, high performing organizations, they hire people, they buy more goods and services, they make donations to the community and support of good causes. Uh, they help develop the brand image uh, of a country and even create confidence with investors, right? So it's quite far reaching uh, if, if we have a number of high performing organizations or a real commitment to excellence in our, in our communities. So what we call the teaser assessment is uh, just to look at the principles, the degree to which the organization or organizations have a commitment uh, to excellence. And uh, in this, we got a really nice cross section, of course. This is where we have most of our respondents, you know, about 1,500 of our respondents did the teaser assessment because it's short and it doesn't take too much time to self assess against the nine principles. But we got a good cross section um, across types of organizations, you know, business, nonprofit, and government the different roles in leadership, management, staff, and other. Other would be things like board members, um, different sizes, micro, small, medium, and, and large. Uh, and what's interesting about the teaser assessment is that we use a subjective scale, you know, and it's kind of like a gut feel. To what extent do we think these principles are really, you know, prevalent in the, in the culture of our organizations? And we found that all the principles were rated in, in what we call the, the medium high range. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was interesting, the, the most highly rated principles were leadership involvement and focus on the cover, customer, which was interesting. And the lowest rated uh, was prevention-based process management. You know, this is preventing problems from occurring or failures from occurring uh, and also database decision-making, which was interesting. Now, when we take a look at, at by role, uh, we saw that uh, the leader and the other roles had, had slightly higher ratings. And, and we also, I've also captured in this presentation some of the open-ended comments that we got just from the last two years, because I, I think the last two years was kind of quite interesting with the whole response to COVID around the world. Um, and so, it, it, it's interesting, and in, in our other reports, of course, we've got lots of comments from previous years as well, but I just wanted to make sure that that was understood in, in this presentation. And so here you see uh, some comments from management and staff and different places around the world about the strengths that they have, you know, and, and it's very encouraging to see strength from, from leadership and boards of, of directors. When we take a look at the principles by size, uh, we see that the large 
uh, size organizations and are, are probably got a little bit of an edge on the on the principles, uh, followed by their other size uh, counterparts. And then we have, again, some really memorable comments from uh, a leader in a micro size organization in the States and also a staff member from a large size organization in, in government in the States. And you can see the extremes. I, I must say, this is one of my favorite things about the study is taking a look at the open-ended comments because it really provides rationale for the ratings and it really lets you know how an organization is doing and when we take a look, let's say, at an individual organization and, and all the open-ended comments and the ratings, it never fails. You know, leaders always say, oh, my goodness, I didn't know that was going on. That's something we could do, uh, we could address right away. And there's these incredible quick wins. And yet there's some things you can work on over short, medium and long term, too. Right. So it's uh, it's always a wealth of, of knowledge. And. And here we see, you know, one organization looks like leadership's really understanding what's important. And, and yet you get the flip side where people really feel um, that, you know, there's a particular focus in an organization at the expense of, uh, of perhaps the people and some other important things. If we look at uh, the principles by type of organization, we see business in the it's got a little bit of an edge. And um, I want to make the, the point here that um, these are just aggregate ratings, you know. Uh, each individual organization has a story of its own. Uh, and each industry sector actually does too when you, when you break down uh, the data and the information. So keep in mind that this is, these are just the overall aggregate ratings from organizations around the world. And here's another comment um, from uh, business and from, from government. Again, some strengths that people have seen uh, in, in organizations. And if we take a look at the principles by general sector, meaning you know, manufacturing and service, we see that they're pretty even, which is surprising. Um, because the you know service sector has a lot more variability to it usually in, in uh, operations and as opposed to the manufacturing sector which can be you know automated to to quite an extent so I was personally surprised to to see that and here's a comment from uh, a manufacturing outfit in the United Arab Emirates and of course a service uh, sector uh, business in Guyana. Now, when we get to a specific industry sector, uh, this is very interesting because this is where we start to see things differentiate a little, a little bit more, and and you can see the the variation in in the uh, ratings. There was 18 industry sectors that had a larger number of respondents, at least 25 or more. Uh, and otherwise, we don't really report the data. And actually, the more the better, because then we get a much clearer picture of what's going on in, in these uh, sectors with, you know, more confidence. But this is interesting, nonetheless. Uh, most ratings were in that medium high range, with the exception of three sectors, and that was agriculture, public administration, which is government, and uh, real estate that were in the kind of medium range. And the professional scientific and technical sector had the highest highest rating. And here's a couple comments, you know, from Fiji and also from India uh, about uh, the strengths in, in organizations uh, as uh, in, in these two example sectors, uh, really positive comments about, um, about on the principal or the cultural side of things. Can you don for, uh, sorry to break in, but we do have a comment online asking for clarity with respect to the actual numbers as a comparison, I believe to what, so the, the question raised, and I believe this would help uh, Georgina and others, what does 6.8 or uh, what does it mean? Uh, or put another way, what do the numbers actually mean? So if you can probably give a little clarity as well on- yeah numbers that would be very useful thanks very much yes the scale 
in all the numbers I'm going to be reporting today, we actually have two scales. On the principal scale, it's kind of a gut feel about the extent to which um, these principles are in place, you know, low, medium, high. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's from zero to 10. Okay. Uh, and uh, when I get to the, talking about the practices, it's a much more objective scale. And uh, it's, again, you'll see the numbers from, from you know, zero to 10. Uh, but it's it's much more objective in terms of the sorts of things that we're looking at. And it's uh, like low would be in this, you know, teaser assessment, low would be, you know, from zero to 20 percent uh, or 0, 0.0 to, to 2.0. And then you've got low, medium, 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 high and high. So that's the, that's the blocks that we see. And in the reports that you download from the web site, um, you can you can see this uh, explained as well. For, for more clarity. But good question. I, I should have explained that a little bit better uh, at the very beginning. Thanks for that. So what we see the principles uh, by, by region, it, it's very interesting. And um, again, we see a little bit more differentiation here in, in terms of the ratings and where um, these different regions are, are sitting. And uh, we've got most of the principles being rated in the medium high range, you know, 6.1 to 8.0, um, with the exception of two regions, which is Latin America and the Caribbean and North America. And they had ratings in the medium, medium range. And the highest rated uh, by organizations in the South Asia region. And here, here's some comments from Turkey and, uh, and Syria, um, just showing, you know, the strengths of, of these particular organizations, you know, great communication and feedback, uh, good working environment, and then great collaboration between leadership and staff, uh, really good communication between customer and staff. And we love to see these sorts of, of comments. And it just gives a view into that organization too a greater extent. Now, I, it's very important to point out that the highest responding countries um, to the teaser assessment have been from these five countries. And you can see the number of respondents. Uh, but there's there's also been, um, you know, some some other other countries that um, have been, you know, very enthusiastic about uh, about this as well, kind of uh, waiting in the wings. And we, we really love it when we get a lot of respondents from a given country or, or a particular region, because then we can speak with much more confidence about how that region is, is doing. You know, so here we're, you know, here we're, we're quite confident in making presentations about, let's say, how a given country compares to other countries, for example, and giving them a sense of really what's going well and, and what needs to improve. Uh, and, and that's something that is really important to, you know, those of us who, who work in professions where we're helping uh, organizations to address issues or to strengthen um, their performance or their organization overall. So just a quick synopsis here about, about the principles or the culture uh, committed to excellence. Uh, we're seeing that the principles were rated more positively by the leadership and other role large size organizations, business type, the professional scientific and technical sector, and the South Asia region. Highest rated principles again, uh, and the lowest rated principles um, that we saw. Now onto the full assessment. So this is where we take a look at the principles and all of those best management practices. So this takes more time to fill out, usually 30 or 40 minutes. And this is probably why we see fewer respondents in this area, but we still, you know, we've still got about 786 uh, respondents at the end of um, 2022, which are these, um, you know, figures. Uh, and then this year, we're really getting a lot uh, of respondents from some of the, you know, industry sectors and, and countries where we wanted to, or regions where we wanted to beef up the data. 
Uh, so that's good. I think by the time we issue our next report, it's, it's going to be really good and uh, we'll be able to share more, more detail. And uh, I also think what I've noticed over the years that we've done this is some of these, you know, ratings, overall aggregate ratings have held pretty steady. And that's another good sign, you know, is that we're getting good, good data and the uh, you know, open ended comments are just uh, fantastic. So I'm just uh, really, really pleased about all of that. So yeah, here's where we've had 786 respondents, uh, you know, good cross section by role and type of organization and, uh, and size. And we see very similar, you know, ratings on the, on the principles as we saw just on the, the teaser assessment. And I kind of keep them separate because I like to see the data when, when an organization fills out just a teaser assessment on its own or whether they're filling out the full assessment that also includes this. Um, but what I, uh, what's very interesting to me is when you take a look at the ratings on the key management areas, um, this is where we see the ratings drop about a point. And it's where the rubber hits the road. You know, it's where organizations are diving in just a little deeper into all those best management practices. So it's been really interesting to see, you know, those ratings uh, drop. And in this, again, this is a much more objective uh, scale that's being, being used here. Um, we've got it kind of divided into, um, you know, four sections of an organization. It's just beginning to kind of be aware of these practices or work on them. Um, the, you know, good start where it's, uh, they've, they've put a lot of the practices in place. Uh, doing well is the next segment where they're, they've got the practices in place. They're starting to see some good results across the balance system measurement. And then high performance where they're really, they've got things in place. They're seeing sustainable improving results uh, for at least three years running. Uh, so this gives you an idea of, you know, where things are. And in those kind of four uh, areas, um, those ratings will between, be between, you know, 0 and 2.5, 2.6 to 5, 5.1 to 7.5, and 7.6 to 10. And so that gives you a sense of, you know, where organizations are. And so... You know, we, we see them in, you know, for the most part in the in the doing well range and the highest rated uh, key management area are for those practices in the customers area and the performance measurement for the organization as a, as a whole. And um, in that particular area of performance measurement, there's 12 measures in total for larger size organizations, but there's just four for micro size organization. So it's really good to see that uh, this is a relatively high rated um, component of these, these key management areas. So here's some comments uh, from Canada and uh, this one particular organization, uh, a strength that they saw, you know, in, in the involvement of both leadership and, and people uh, and how, of course, like a lot of organizations, some departments really have great leaders um, that provide the necessary support to employees. But then there's also this opportunity that other departments, much less so, where the, the employees really don't have a lot of direction and they're kind of floundering. So it's very, very interesting to get these open-ended comments back. It really, really pinpoints where the work needs to be done. Now, when we're taking a look at, at the key management areas by size, and that's just an abbreviation at the top of the screen, KMA just means key management area. Um, for, we see the, the large size organizations having uh, a, a bit of a, a higher uh, average uh, rating overall. And by type, we see again, business has, has got the edge uh, in terms of a higher uh, aggregate rating. And here we see a bit of a differentiation between manufacturing and service with manufacturing have a, having a slightly higher, higher rating on the key management areas. And when we take a look by specific sector, there's 12 sectors that had more than 25 respondents. And, you know, most of these uh, ratings are in the doing well range with the exception of public administration, which is government. 
um, that had uh, a rating in, in kind of the good start range. And the highest rating that we we saw was in the electricity sector, which also includes those involved with gas, steam, and air conditioning. And that's a pretty regulated industry sector, so that's that's not surprising uh, in a lot of uh, respects. By region, um, you know, we see some variation here uh, with you know East Asia and Pacific out front. And again, lower rating in that uh, North America. I, I was frankly pretty surprised by this because I thought Canada and the United States would do pretty good. But you know, uh, we're not. <laughs> we seem to be drilling behind a little bit. And uh, of course, I've got some thoughts about why that is, but um, it's these are, the, these are the ratings nonetheless. So it really gives us a sense on, on where organizations are at. And it's always interesting to to kind of take a look at this sort of thing. Again, here's the high responding countries uh, to this, this full assessment. And it's really good to see, you know, pretty good coverage around the world. And a lot of the, the high responding countries it indicates who's really interested in this sort of thing. And it's also an indication of our researchers too. I mean, who was really great in terms of attracting uh, respondents uh, as well. And and in, in the wings, are, there's some other countries aspiring in the same direction. They're, they're getting pretty close to having, um, you know, quite a number of, of organizations. Uh, Vietnam and Pakistan have 24 respondents. Malaysia has 16, Egypt has 13. Uh, so I think when we, we find when we do work in particular countries or regions and, and really appeal to uh, a, a group to take a look at a real time assessment, there's quite a bit of enthusiasm and, and so we've been able to do that around the world and, uh, and it, it helps us get the respondents and, and make the data and information that's available even better for everybody. Just, some, just another quick clarification, uh, Don. sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, but there is, and I think that this is important, so persons can appreciate the research study as, as you go along. And the question was raised, what is the difference between the two performance management uh, key principles, one, uh, one side had a uh, zero with inverted with the um, inverted commas after it, and and maybe if you can clarify that, that would be very useful. In the well, in the performance measurement area, there's it's broken. The con, there's the, the principle of continuous improvement and performance measurement is really got three subcategories. One is continuous improvement. You know, taking a look at your organization across the key management areas and look at what's going well and what needs to improve and thinking about, you know, what you want to do. Uh, and, and then in performance measurement, um, we've got um, the performance measurement that we do in each of the key management areas to take a look at how we're doing in that particular area. Uh, and then we've got performance measurement, which gives us a view of what's going on in the organization as a whole. And so those performance measures are organization wide. Now, micro size organizations on those organization wide members measures only have four measures. Um, and that is uh, taking a look at the quality of a product or service, um, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction and financial results. Whereas larger size organizations have got 12 measures um, that they can choose from, you know, a handful of measures that'll give them a good feel for uh, what's going on in their organization. But when we take a look at the key management areas, uh, and there's nine of, you know, eight areas actually that you, you might want to measure performance in a bit more detail. Um, that is something that micro size organizations aren't encouraged to do because they're small organizations and they need to just focus on a few member uh, measures whereas larger size organizations are bigger and more complex and and they need to have a good handful of measures like maybe about eight measures that that they want to get a read on how things are going in the governance area or the leadership area or the customers area and so forth um, and so that's why we differentiate uh, those two does that does that answer the question? Um, okay, it's a good question. I think so. I don't see a follow up comment, but if there is a follow up comment, then I'll raise it with you. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, there is a follow up comment. Comment saying thank you. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. 
Now, if we look at each one of these key management areas, we we see the you know the results, the aggregate results on the on the uh, practices, and uh, the one practice that's got the highest rating, uh, one point three. This is really good to see because this is the one practice that's applicable to micro size organizations and of course to their larger size counterparts. But this is making sure that um, the uh, governance system and organization meets obligations such as legal, financial, ethical, and reporting. So it's really good to see that there's a strength there. And some comments again um, from, this is a, just an example of an organization in, in Indonesia where it's interesting when you take a look at the comments because they say on one hand, they've got good corporate governance practices, but on the other hand, they've got some real concerns or issues going on with complaints not being resolved and, and legal issues and, and things like that. So we always kind of keep an eye on those, on those kind of comments and, and we want to dig a little bit deeper to see what's going on uh, because well, why are there public concerns and why are there complaints? This is where we need to take a look at other uh, practices that might be contributing to that. So it's really important that we take a look at results for an organization in a really holistic manner because everything's between these principles and practices, everything's interrelated and interconnected. And their practices influence the principles and, and we've defined uh, all of that. So it, it becomes a really great diagnostic uh, when you're trying to help an organization, you know, strengthen or improve uh, their performance. On the leadership side of things, there's quite a few more practices in the leadership area. And, and this is where we see some strength in the developing corporate statement, which is great. That's your vision, mission, values. Uh, and the lowest rated practice was using risk management to assess the strategic goals and, uh, and objectives. Risk management has been something that's becoming, you know, really popular over the last number of years. So it's something that organizations are, are starting to pay attention to. But another lower rated practice is uh, removing the barriers to organizational effectiveness. And this is where, you know, leadership has to take a look at what's getting in the way of employees doing good work, right? Here's a, a comment again from an organization in Indonesia, you know, good corporate statements, but the comment about the quality management system that they use to be understood by senior management, this speaks volumes, doesn't it? Um, you know, why would, let's say, someone in management, uh, a quality manager or something like that, understand that? And, and yet it's not understood uh, at the leadership level. So great opportunity there. On the planning side of things, this refers to business planning, and this is where we want to see alignment with the strategic plan. Uh, and uh, very interesting over the last, you know, few years is, uh, and this has been pretty consistent over time, but developing contingency plans and developing, uh, you know, conducting a capability gap analysis have been low rated. And we've seen a lot of comments, um, especially during the, the COVID years where a lot of organizations were really caught, um, you know, unaware by the disruption and, and having the means to respond to it successfully. But on the flip side, it's good to see that using factual information for business planning is a higher, higher rated practice here. And here's some work from the public sector here in Canada. We've had some pretty good participation from all levels of, of government and uh, interesting comment about their strength being they're good at putting out fires, <laughs> but they, they said, boy, we don't spend near enough time on planning. So it's um, work to do, right? Work to do. And you might think that uh, organizations have got this well in hand, some very basic things like business planning, but uh, not so much, right? It's good to know. Good to know where you need to do the work. On the customer side of things, this is where organizations are a little bit, a little bit stronger. And uh, we see the highest rated practice is responding successfully to customer feedback. And the lowest one is using research to define and segment customers. 
and also train and empower employees to be advocates for the customer. I find it's really interesting because how do we serve the customer if we really haven't researched them and segmented them and really understand, you know, who they are and what their wants, needs and expectations are? And we do, you know, a bit of a matching exercise to the product or service that we're providing them. It's, it's uh, very interesting to me that we, this is running a little on the low, the lower side, this particular practice and what a difference it would make if, if organizations paid a little bit more attention to this. And here, uh, some evidence of that uh, from a nonprofit in Canada. They've just done their first survey to gain feedback from clients on their experience with their organization. And they, another thing, a real opportunity for them is they haven't done much to review client complaints to see trends and patterns. And there's such a wealth of information from that. So it's, it's good to see that um, this is giving them some ideas about things that they can be doing a little bit better. On the employee side of things is again, quite a few practices in this particular area and the highest rated practices were ensuring a healthy workplace environment and getting people involved in addressing issues related to health and wellness, which is super to see that. Um, but the lowest rated practice was encouraging employees to be innovative and to take educated risks. So that's something that we've seen in the marketplace for quite a number of years now, that emphasis on innovation. And uh, this, these, there's a couple of practices in here that are so important. And that's encouraging employees to share their suggestions and ideas and and also uh, being innovative. That brings you probably 90% of any improvement you'll ever realize that an organization comes from the people who do the work, right? You'll get other ideas from outside uh, by benchmarking with other organizations and learning from others or learning from advisors and so forth. But these are really important practices um, that are, are very important. And it's surprising to me that organizations are, are you know, this is rated a bit lower than, encouraging people to be innovative. So it'll be good to see that more emphasis on, on that. And uh, a com comments again from the public administration sector in, in Canada, um, good work environment, but the opportunity to include employees in, in decision-making and on improvement initiatives. On the work processes area, and this is where a lot of people that work in quality management or quality assurance, you know, plays a lot of, of emphasis. And, you know, one of the highest rated practices is taking corrective action when problems occur. Uh, and, uh, and then, but on the flip side, the lowest rated practice really stands out in this area is, is using external uh, data to, you know, compare um, performance to other organizations. And this is this whole area of benchmarking. And uh, it's something that we, I know when I was working with the Global Benchmarking Network, I'm on, I was on the board for a time. It was very interesting to see the benchmarking work that's being done in countries around the world and who's not doing it. And one thing, one thing I really learned was North America is really not doing it. And uh, it's like they're complacent or they think they know what's best. Um, but other countries are um, able to realize even more improvement because they're keeping an eye on not only what they're doing, but what others are doing too, and learning from others. You can save a lot of time by learning from others that are doing certain things very well, you know, given practices or given key management areas. And if we, if we take a look at the, the key, I'm sorry, this is just a repeat uh, slide. Um, I'm just going to skip over that is out of uh, comment <laughs> about management, uh, you know, talking about good change management and, and the need to uh, take advantage of, of benchmarking uh, data for comparison. Now onto the suppliers and partners area. Um, this is where we've just got five practices and, and we see that organizations are pretty strong on selecting their suppliers and partners on the basis of criteria, but where they're a little, you know, where they need to do a little bit work is working with suppliers and partners in the um, developing and uh, not only meeting, but exceeding social and environmental standards. Um, and there's another practice, you know, they're all, these are all really important practices, but it's, it's, 
it's kind of interesting how often organizations don't think about working really closely with their suppliers and partners and, and what a difference uh, it, it makes. Here's a, a comment from public uh, sector in, in Canada um, about, you know, this emphasis on doing requests for proposals and, and selecting the best supplier on multiple criteria, but not realizing that they could be working with their suppliers more to develop products and services that are best for the situation rather than just looking at what's available. And so this is going to be an area that is, is going to be a, an area that might really make a, a big difference to, to public administration. On the resource uh, management uh, area of things, um, this is, is we're taking a look at all sorts of resources like assets and technology and knowledge management and, uh, and so forth. And, and this is where uh, we see that uh, Organizations are pretty good at defining uh, their resource uh, requirements and, and managing the security of the resources. Um, and, and in relatively strength uh, across the, the rest of, uh, of the practices actually in this area. So this is, this is good to, this is good to, to see. And some comments uh, from Indonesia, from transportation and storage sector about how uh, their company's done a lot of work on things like disaster management, their emergency response system and allocating financial resources. But there's a little bit more work that needs to be done on the financial side of things uh, because they're you know, noticing some issues there. Now here's where we get to the three subsectors of the continuous improvement and performance measurement area. And we can see that organizations are taking a step back and looking at the key management areas. And there's a particular focus on the customer's area, but they're doing pretty good at, at reflecting on, on the, you know, these key other key management areas as well. And on the performance measurement side, if they're measuring performance in each of the key management areas, you know, we see there's probably more emphasis on leadership measures and customer measures, but, uh, there's a good balance system on measurement being used by small, medium, and large size organizations. And if we take a look at the measures for the organization as a whole, it's really good to see these four measures that are important to micro size, um, the quality of products and services, customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction, and financial performance have got pretty good ratings. But you know, surprisingly, employee satisfaction could be a little bit better. Um, I think that's pretty important. Uh, to, to organizations and, and one of the, you know, the highest, you know, rated, of course, is quality of products or services. That's, that's, that's good to see there, that, and not surprising to see financial performance. That's where a lot of organizations, uh, you know, focus uh, their attention, but larger organizations should really be using kind of a balanced uh, system of measurement uh, with a lot of these uh, measures that, that we see being used around the world with the different excellence models. So it's a good place to take uh, measures, adopt measures from, because that's gonna help you compare your performance to others if you choose to do benchmarking as well. And here's some comments uh, from uh, a small size uh, business in manufacturing, uh, where the company is meeting their financial goals, but they're leaving behind the employee <laughs> morale, training, and culture, which is a real opportunity for improvement. Because this is another thing we've seen in the research that, you know, if if you spend time on employee employee satisfaction, uh, that will translate into higher customer satisfaction, and that in turn translates into profitability and, uh, and on the business side of things. And we even see it on the on the public sector side of things too that translates into, because they're not looking at profitability, they're looking at tendency, let's say, to refer and recommend things like, you know, mass transit or, or public transit or something like that. We see this, this confidence that builds from the employee to the customer to the organization and the um, tendency to want to work more with the organization. Uh, so these comments from Latvia are very, very telling. So overall, if we consider all these practices across the key management areas, 
Again, we saw the higher ratings for the customers area and the performance measurement area for the organization as a whole, and the lowest ratings for the suppliers and partners area. And management had a tendency to provide slightly higher ratings, uh, large size organizations, business, manufacturing as a general sector, the electricity sector as a specific sector, and the East uh, Asia and Pacific region. Highest rated practices overall, you know, governance meeting obligations and on the customer side uh, of things, determining needs and expectations and responding to feedback on the work processes, taking corrective action and performance measurement. You know, three of those four measures that we want to see in, in uh, micro-sized organizations, good to see those. But on the lowest rated practices, the contingency plans, the capability gap analysis, the benchmarking, uh, working more closely with suppliers and partners on standards uh, were, were prevalent. So overall, you know, as you look at these results, I think to myself, you know, organizations around the world, if we're taking a look at the aggregate ratings, you're really doing quite well on the principles and the best management practices. And they're using a balanced system measurement. I think that's just fantastic. Uh, and yes, there's room for improvement, but they've got, they seem to have pretty good management systems in place. Uh, and we'll see nuances with individual organizations, but overall doing quite well. But, and there's several opportunities for improvement and we see it in the preparing for and managing change, um, benchmarking, and then working with the suppliers and partners on, on these standards. And interesting to me, of the respondents that responded to, you know, this assessment in the last two years, I was really surprised uh, by the comments about the pandemic uh, and the government lockdowns, because this had a profound effect on not only citizens, but organizations, particularly businesses. And, and I saw in the comments, you know, some pretty positive comments. It's like they had a commitment to excellence. They were focusing on their customer. The leaders and employees were working hard to deal with the situation and they were able to adapt to change. And, uh, but they, they noted that, gee, we need to prepare for these sorts of unforeseen events better. Um, and I think it's just really important to say that, you know, this is overall aggregate uh, results because we saw, we saw within what happened around the world, you know, on, on an individual organization basis, we saw real extremes from those that responded quite well and, you know, could turn on a dime and adapt to the other end of the scale where loads of peop people were, you know, losing businesses and having a real hard time. So that's just a reminder that we have to take a look at each and every organization uh, because they're unique. And we need to take a look at, well, what's going well and what needs to improve so that organization can build on their strengths and address their opportunities for improvement. Um, and they can uncover unknown issues and quick wins and know, gee, where do we focus effort uh, so that this is really going to make a difference to the performance of our organization? And, and in doing that, I just want to highlight, you know, some different ways of reporting that we have. Here's for you know, here's for organizations that are pretty sophisticated and, and taking a look at the principles and practices. You know, we've got a color coded kind of chart and they when they do an assessment with a good cross section of their employees and it's got the principles running across the top and the practices running down the left hand side. And we show all the touch points between the relationships, direct relationships between the practices and the principles, what's influencing. And we can color code it uh, so that those red areas are these are areas where this is we really need to focus uh, some effort on improvement. Um, and and when you yellow uh, less so, and when you're in the blue and green area, it's like you're doing you're doing quite well. So this short report really draws our focus to what's going well and and where we need to uh, place some effort. Uh, and it reinforces the relationships between, let's say you've got a low rated principle, like, you know, uh, 
partnership development and you could scan down the column and see, well, what practices influence that? Why is that low rated? What do I need to work on, right? But there's just another example of an organization that we did work with over a number of years and they did three assessments and you could see that each time they did an assessment, uh, it just, they got better and better for the most part in, in these, on the principal side of things. And then we take a look at what's going on in the key management areas. And this is a particularly interesting organization because when we did our first assessment with them, it was a manufacturing organization that had just acquired another company and we did them separately. But then on your second time we did an assessment, we pulled them together. And, and they we found by doing these assessments and orienting them on this, it really helped them bring the two organizations together uh, to start operating as, as one and knowing exactly where to focus effort on improvement over the years. You know, so one year they're working on their documenting their work processes better and another year that they were working on on the training and development of their employees and so forth. So it uh, it was really good for them over the short, medium and longer term. And here's an example of, uh, we take a look at a country uh, versus other countries. And this particular example is taken from the United States. And so organizations in the United States, you can see are trailing behind other countries on a lot of uh, the key management areas um, all except for one, really, suppliers and partners. So it's very telling about where people need to, you know, make a bit of uh, an effort in, in their organizations. And just another comment about open-ended comments being absolute pure gold. Um, the, you know, people mention things that leadership does not know anything about and can address right away. So you've got these quick wins coming out of it. They provide ideas and suggestions that really make a difference. And they really, their perceptions provide a very robust view of their current state. Um, it's amazing what, what comes out of that when organizations do this on an individual basis. But then it's also really beneficial for an industry sector and uh, for a, a country as a, as a whole, um, because they all have their different motivations, you know, about how they want to perform or how they want to be seen in the marketplace uh, and the difference that this sort of thing makes. So when we take a look at the future, here's my crystal ball. Um, this study is going to continue because we want to pursue the original uh, intention of capturing uh, the current state of organizational excellence and, and making others aware of, of where we're sitting across size and industry sector, region and gradually country. Um, and we, we do this because we know the benefits are going to be far reaching. You know, it's all about improving the performance of organizations. Um, and this contributes to the economy, trade, trickles into resident quality of life. It allows more countries to participate sustainably in the global economy. And it makes the world a better place for future generations. So these are pretty lofty goals, but I believe that we can do it uh, because we've got, especially if we work collaboratively, because look at all the great professionals that are out there in the world that have areas of specialty or generalists that can take a look at uh, these, these practices and contribute to helping organizations strengthen what they're doing in those areas. Um, collectively, I think we can all make a, a difference if we can, we can work together um, to strengthen organizations and, and make a real difference in the communities and the regions and the countries where we live. Um, and it's uh, good news at the end of the day if we're successful in, in doing that together. So with that, I'll stop and we can open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you so very much, uh, Dawn. I, I took note that uh, Norma, who is Norma Shorey, Yes. who is a past president of the Barbados chapter of the CI, CMC, the Caribbean Institute of Management Consultancies Online. And yes. I want to open her mic. I did have a quick chat with her during, the, during your presentation to okay. just give a comment on some of the findings. And I think that her uh, comments would be uh, quite useful. So uh, okay. I will uh, open your mic, Norma, and uh, we, we, we are happy to have you share any comments. Thank you very much, Jerry. Can you hear me? 
We can hear you, yes. Wonderful. Excellent presentation, Dawn. That is some really good material and, and insights and information, which I think would be very important, sorry, which is not would be, which is very important for us as consultants yeah. to have a better appreciation for. I'm just in the process of designing some training around some of these issues. And I thought, okay, yeah, I need to make sure that I mention some of these points. Um, and um, what my question, which I put in the Q&A was, um, I, I believe that we are going to be able to get access to this report. Oh, Is yeah. it going to yes. be? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Because then we can utilize that report and draw on it and refer to it. And, wow. and in that regard, I am really so, so pleased of the collaboration between Dawn and Jerry, both of whom I know um, from, from all of our work in, their, in our consulting fields. I'm yes. really pleased at this collaboration. And I really think that, that, the, the, that, that this initiative that you have started in terms of collecting this data worldwide is going to be valuable, not only to the wider um, the, 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 the wider globe, but let us see how we can utilize it more um, for our Caribbean development. So I'm really pleased to be part of this webinar and to hear some of the, of the, of the findings and the implications for us. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, Norma. You. And that's a great observation because, do you know, um, the excellence model, all the practices in the excellence model dovetail beautifully with the certified management consulting body of knowledge. Um, there's just one area where certified management consultants need to do more work, and that's in the work processes area. And that's where the quality management professionals and the quality assurance professionals come in because they have real strength in that area, you know? So I, I found personally when I first started working in this area that that's where I need to do a little bit more work just to beef up my skill set. But the good news is, is that uh, CMCs can can get up and running with taking a look at this data and thinking, gee, how can we help organizations strengthen or improve their performance in these areas where we need to do so? And they have the knowledge and the skills to, to, to do that beautifully. Uh, and of course, the areas of specialty, if you just want to work in a particular practice or, or key management area. So it's, it's, it's good news for CMCs in the region and around the globe. And it's also, there's other professionals too in business advisory services that have uh, similar bodies of knowledge, like the accounting profession is another good one, right? Yes. So, um, and, and then there's professions like human resource professionals. Well, they've really got a uh, good depth and breadth of, of skills in the employees area. You know, so if we take a look at our, you know, professional counterparts, we find that, you know, under this umbrella that we call an excellence model with all those darn practices, you know, we all have something that we can contribute and we all have to work together to strengthen organizations or a region. Um, if, if, uh, if we, if we really want to make a, a difference, it brings everybody together, um, to, to really, really make a difference. And so, I think that's an important uh, message here. And even within the CMC membership, you've got people with different areas of specialty. You know, I, I've met a lot of the CMCs in the, in the Caribbean and we've got, and appreciating their individual differences in areas of specialty. Um, it, it takes a village. That's all what I want to say when we when it comes to doing this sort of work, if you want to be ambitious and take on the region uh, or a country, you know, let's say even an industry sector, um, in, in, in places uh, around the globe. So that's what I would really encourage is that people find a way, you know, to work well together and that we gather the data in a fair bit of depth so that you really have some good data to work with, right? Yeah. And, and open-ended comments. It really tells a wonderful story. Yeah, Thanks, excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dawn. Yvette. Thank you. Yeah, there are a few uh, questions and I, I find them quite intriguing. Uh, Ryan uh, made a comment and I'm certain you may want to comment on this as well, uh, Don. He indicated interesting to see that often the micro to small organizations may score high 
on collaboration and communication as organizations grow, these aspects can drop in performance, even with more automation and standardization. And he had a follow-on note, which indicated database decision-making principles score is low. Could you maybe share um, more details on the context of that aspect? Yeah, I think, you know, when you take a look at micro size organizations, you know, one to 25 employees, they, they, they only have so many people to do the work, right? It's, it's almost like it gets easier when, when you become larger uh, and you've got more employees, makes the lifting a little bit lighter, right? Um, a lot of, and you, and you think, I think it's really important to talk about the collaboration and the cooperation that was mentioned as being really important to organizations of any size, but in particular micro, because you're trying your, your best to be strong and to develop and grow and do what you need to do to survive out there in the, in the marketplace. And I, I reflect on entrepreneurs when they're first getting their businesses uh, up and running, um, or even nonprofits, there's only so many people, often volunteers helping to get, get something done. You do need to collaborate and, and cooperate with others because you can bring strengths to the table that you might not otherwise have in house. And, and that makes a world of difference. But I, I say in doing that, be really careful that you're operating in, in true collaboration. And I wrote a blog about this song. It's on the website because I feel very strongly about this. You know, so often we get into so-called collaborative relationships, but they're not win-win. And we got to make sure that they are. Uh, and so that there is mutual benefit. You know, the collaboration and the co cooperation is win-win is and it's uh, beneficial on, on both sides. And of course, yes, technology plays a role. So many people talking about technology and, and what can be used these days to make our work a little bit easier. Um, the only caution I, I say about technology is don't be too quick to jump at technology until you've proven that it does indeed um, contribute to improvement. And uh, I see that that's something that, um, you know, organizations could be doing a much better job at uh, in selecting the technology that they use is testing it out and trying it out before adopting it, making sure it does indeed contribute to improvement. Thank you. And there, there, there's a, a question from Betty, uh, and I, I want to go to that one fairly quickly. And I, I thought this quite interesting about what percentage of organizations in this study scored close to 10 on principles uh, and, KM, and KMA, key management, Practices. I thought that was quite interesting, and uh, actually, I I took note of the fact that um, in the area under uh, performance management, that employee morale was quite low compared to a number of areas. But I think more specifically, Betty's question on whether or not there were companies that were scoring close to ten, uh, and mm -hmm. how prevalent that 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 um, has been in the study. It's, you know what, we're getting a really good cross section of organizations, uh, thank goodness, that um, are along a continuum of, I've never heard about excellence models, all the way up to we're using an excellence model and we're doing a really good job. Uh, so there's just a few, you know, there's a few organizations that are scoring quite high on the principles and, and the key management areas and they're using, you know, excellence models. Um, or they've, you know, designed their own system that includes the practices within. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we, we do, and we recognize some of the names of those organizations and we know that they're, they're high performing organizations, or let's say they've received an, a national excellence award, which, uh, is, you know, is judged by third party assessors. Um, but it's, it's actually, you know, it's pretty low percentage when you in the whole scheme of things. And that reflects what's going on in the world. You know, number one, only 10 to 20 percent of professionals, the working population even knows about excellence models. So that's got to change, <laughs> you know, so they can use this in their organizations and perform better. Right. And uh, and then those that, that use the excellence model, they kind of fall into two camps 
most of the leaders I've worked with, 90% of them want to address issues or get better results, do you know? And, you know, they're reporting to a board and they want to look good as a leader and, um, you know, convey that, yes, they've done a good job. They leave a great legacy. 10% will say, yes, they want better results, but they also want to go for an award and they like that external recognition, right? So we see, we see organizations that are, that are high performing, you know, a few that might have earned an excellence award but the the vast majority in the high performing area aren't seeking external recognition. They just want to perform better. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's they're facing fierce competition or whatever the reason might be. Right. So this is a nice thing we see is this continuum of respondents. And uh, and whenever we do work with an organization and we get, you know, we invite all the employees to participate we normally get about 60% of the employees responding and participating in the assessment, which is fantastic. But we, for this particular index, we only take three representative um, people from an organization and in putting it in the index because we don't want to skew the results. So uh, that's what's happening. That's what's happening there. Um, so it's, I think, the index reflects what we see in the marketplace and in terms of high performing organizations, there's not, there's really not that many. Um, the vast majority of organizations, especially when I take a look at most economies, you know, 90% of your, let's say business um, sector is small organizations. And to me, this is, this is where we ne really need to do the work is with micro and small size businesses in a lot of respect so that they can become grow and develop and become high performing and survive. Right. And I think we, we really need to do work with government because government, there are a handful of governments around the world that have had a commitment to excellence and done a lot of work in that regard. And the results have shown Singapore is a good example uh, of that. It's absolutely amazing what they've been able to, to do. And in the nonprofit sector, I, I think that while well, some of our large nonprofits are doing quite well, I mean, they're well oiled machines and they've got membership revenue coming in and they can support a staff. The vast majority of nonprofit associations are just trying to survive, you know, and sometimes um, they're run by volunteers or, or they're run by people that may not know, know an awful lot about this sort of thing. And I think there's so much good work that we can do to strengthen each one of these types of organizations, you know, government and, and nonprofit and, and business and help them all to be the best they can be. And it, it shouldn't be too daunting. That's why we've tried to make it more simple and straightforward and more time efficient and cost effective so that all of these organizations that want to do some work in this area can do it uh, painlessly. <laughs> Because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but we've tried to make it uh, less less painful. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, straight question. Is there an issue across organizations globally with respect to the morale of staff, given the rating of four point, whatever it was, compared to other areas, performance areas? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the results are quite telling. And um, when you see comments like we did in the um, open-ended comments, like that uh, organizations are focusing more on financial results than in forgetting at the employees, I think that happens in a lot of organizations. A lot of the organizations that I've worked with, they're so focused on the financial side of things at the expense of the other things, you know. And I, I think that's why the balance system of measurement is good. That's why I look at all the key management areas and the practices within them is good. Um, is it because it, it, it takes off the blinders, you know, because you could be focused, the leaders could be focused on the financial results at the expense of all this other thing that really makes a difference to per performance and the financial results just follow. Um, you know, it's, and we see time and time again, we see, examples of organizations that have been quite high performing and they've really focused on this sort of thing. Toyota is a good example of that. 
And years ago, the board made a little bit of a shift to focusing more on profitability. And all of a sudden, oh, there's some recalls happening. And then things happening that, that they're not, that are things that are very, very costly, right? And then, and then they were able to adjust and shift back to the focus on the whole, the, the organization as a system of all these interrelated and interconnected practices and, and how you really got to take a look at your organization as like the, the doctor does with the human body. You've got to make sure everything's working well together, right? For that person to be healthy. But it's the same for an organization. These principles and practices are all these things that need to be working well and are interrelated and interconnected. And, and we need to make sure they're all in good shape for the organization to perform well. And it this makes it a, a beautiful diagnostic when something's amiss to pinpoint exactly what it is and what to do about it. I'll tell you, I in my work as a certified management consultant, I started working in this area when the excellence models were first introduced. And um, I found to myself that it was a brilliant uh, diagnostic. It allowed me to add so much more value to the work I was doing, not only in the diagnostic sense, and but in the recommendation sense. Uh, and and you, you have to make care, be careful though, that you don't overwhelm a client with the whole elephant, you know, you need to just, you just need to zoom in on, on the client issues or, or strategic imperatives and, and be able to give your advice and gradually step-by-step step, encourage them to, to do the work that needs to be done uh, when they're ready, willing, and able. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question from Ryan mm -hmm. uh, where he is asking whether the responses based on uh, were the responses based on organizations own interpretation of what the principles and key management areas were in their own organizations uh, he goes on to say i guess what i'm trying to understand is are organizations actively applying these already before taking the assessment or are they interpreting what it means in their own uh, context mm -hmm. well in when they do the assessment each principle is defined. And then they're asked for what's your gut feel? What To what extent do you think this principle is in place in your organization throughout your organization? And, and same with the best management practices are, are you know, there's a, a line of information that uh, asks them to um, use a different rating scale to say, Gee, this, this practice of business planning, for example, is this, are people aware of this throughout our organization that we have a business plan? Is it deployed throughout the organization? Do people have a good understanding of it? Um, is it something that we're doing really well? We're getting good results with, you know? Uh, and so that scale is much more objective. And most of the terms that are used in the sentences are, are ones that are pretty easily understood. And if people don't understand them, they say, gee, I don't know if we're doing this or not. You know, that's very telling too, because I know one of the, we've done work with organizations where they hadn't been doing strategic planning, like municipal governments or, you know, in the business sector, the, the people and the employees in the uh, organization didn't know the, anything about the business plan. And so it was a wake-up call for the leaders. Well, they did have a business plan. They've got to communicate about it better, do you know? So these the comments that we get back are really provide the rationale for the ratings and um, and it, it tells a, a story. And we haven't had many instances over the years where people say, gee, I don't understand. But we what we do, and this is like staff management leadership, right? What we do when we've done this, you know, in a kind of a workshop setting and getting in people in an organization to do a, a self-assessment together and having good conversations about what they're doing or not doing, the, the, the most interesting comments I've had are from staff who say, I've never been asked my opinion before. <laughs> and, and I said, well, today's the day because your opinion counts and we want to hear it. And so then before you know it, people are rolling up their sleeves and leadership and management and staff are working at tables together to talk about practices and, you know, what's going well and what needs to improve. 
And it's this wealth of information that you get from the perspectives. And in our, in our reports too, with an individual organization, we'll be able to capture how leadership management and staff or the other categories see a particular practice. Is there, and there's always differences between the way the roles see things. And there in itself is a, is a good conversation about yeah. that and why it is that way and what can be done about it, right? Yeah. Because what you want ideally is for all these things to be in place and things running consistently and predictably, right? And you want everybody in the organization to know what's going on, right? Um, and there's lots of communication running throughout these models so, so that, that you can enable that. Um, so it's uh, it's always good to take a look. Well, what is the current state, and and then how do we get to that desired future state that I just described? And it's it's very stepwise uh, progression. If you're going to do this kind of work over however long it's going to take your organization, to, depends on how much you have to do. But uh, chip away at it year after year after year, and the way we do it when we have individual action plans on our reports about the things they need to work on, we always say, okay, who's going to be responsible for doing this? Uh, how are you going to measure your progress? Are there any out-of-pocket costs? And, and what's the time frame? And invariably, when you assign things out to people in the organization, that lightens the load and distributes what needs to be done across um, all the people, sometimes they need a little help from consultants with training or coaching or, or what have you. Uh, but th this becomes their system that they're all working on and they're all working towards a common aim of, of getting better results. Uh, you know, so it really accelerates the culture committed to excellence in year one of doing this. Uh, and, and then it, and getting everyone to be involved and engaged in it um, also helps an organization accomplish this much more quickly. And it's just a small percentage of people's time in, involved in, in making this happen. And on every single occasion, I just am so amazed by the good work that people do. And then, and then they call might ask you for your help or support in areas where maybe they don't have the expertise or they don't have the time or, you know, people need some more training. So you transfer that knowledge. Um, and uh, it, it all gets, uh, it all gets uh, it done. And um, in, you know, remarkable period of time, really, um, people are taking a small percentage of their time to chip in and, and work on things and it can, uh, it can actually progress quite quickly. Yeah. What, what I found quite interesting in the uh, results was that there seems to be an average five to six uh, uh, along the scale of one to 10, where mm -hmm. organizations both uh, at the sectoral level as well as at the national level have been scoring. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, looking at that data, the question that um, surfaces is, you know, whether or not organizations across the globe are operating at just average. And, and, and then within the context of operating at average, you know, this matter of how resources are being managed and whether or not there's a huge wastage of resources or for that matter, um, the uh, a low uh, capacity usage, you know, within the firm certainly uh, comes to mind. Uh, would you say, based on the results, that uh, most companies are just operating uh, average, or would you say they are average to good? Or I mean, what what would be your general interpretation, not by sector, but across the global context? Well, you know, most organizations that, that we've done work with, um, you know, have got, you know, quite a number of these practices already in place. Um, and and they might they might need to work on, you know, maybe about 25 of them of the 102 practices. That's not too bad. 
and the and the it's different levels of sophistication like the, to the degree to which a practice is is really fully deployed and operating well and they're getting results and continuous improving i mean that's the ideal circumstance that's the high performance circumstance but we've we find that um organizations that have been around for a while um generally have quite a bit of this in place and they just need to zero in and and focus on on a few problem areas and those areas um you know they can focus on and do the work over let's say the next three years um and this is this is just giving them the, they need all that time to focus on being in the business that they're in but they do need a little bit of time to to work on on some of the problematic spots you know or the low rated items and uh and it's amazing what can be accomplished by people within the organization working on these things and uh, and then sometimes uh, training, and then sometimes sometimes organizations need a little help. I mean, an example of that is uh, an organization that we worked with uh, a couple years ago, where we put their training program, which was a massive number of PowerPoint slides, um, onto a learner management system, and we reduced the number of PowerPoint slides, and we made it much more interesting and exciting, and and even humorous, you know. Uh, and so this made a huge difference to the employee time that was being dedicated to to doing this repetitive training. Uh, and it, it freed up people to do other things that they needed to concentrate on, let's say in this area, it was a health and safety area. And and then there was people involved in human resources in in hiring and selecting and training and making sure people had their tickets up to date. Um, it made a huge difference to that organization to have that automated, it, it made a huge difference just to recruitment and selection because people were dropping out uh, before even being really hired because of the way the system was working, right? And, and so sometimes they need help with things like that because they don't know anything about learner management systems, right? Or they don't know anything about how to make their, uh, in this particular case, it was health and safety training. They didn't, they didn't know about how to make that better, you know? And so um, we took what they had been working with and, and uh, you know, made it, made it a little bit better and then put it on a system that could really streamline things for them. And it's a huge, huge return on investment they get from doing something like that, right? Thank you so very much, Don. We are pretty much uh, almost out of time and what I, would want to uh, say as we bring this conversation, which I'm certain we're going to have again to a close, is that, uh, and, and Betty said it in her comments as well, that an organization is a system. And you made the comment as well that an organization is a system. It's a complete you know, mechanism. And I believe the reference you made was that to the body. And to focus on one area and not the other is to create some deficiency gaps that are not necessary in organization. And it appears to me as though leadership has a vital role to play in ensuring that the overall functioning of the organization is attended to. And what better ways of addressing that than empowering staff to be effective in their specific roles uh, what better ways of addressing that than maybe paying attention to what appears to be low morale among uh, staff? How about, you know, uh, creating forums where staff can more readily be heard and can provide feedback to address a lot of these deficiency gaps? And I guess the question that we walk away from this with is, are these deficiency gaps points of hemorrhage within these organizations that can very well improve the profitability, create opportunity for growth, and at the same time create you know the wider opportunity for connection with the uh, within the social groupings, building social capital, building uh, capital in other areas, especially social capital where a lot of the issues confronted by societies that these organizations serve uh, have to deal with. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's so important that we continue to look at these matters 
as organizations, and especially within the region, a resource scarce area. I want to say thank you so very much, Don, for presenting on these global findings. Uh, I want to say to those who joined us for this conversation that the recording will be available within another day or so, so that you can review uh, this. And I see Anna has raised the question, I'm not sure if this was addressed, but is there anywhere that we can see the data collection instrument? I'm curious about the questions asked. Definitely think they would be thought provoking when applied to my workplace or nationality. Uh, this will be the, the, the report, is an available report, Don? That yes. I've got the I've got the three published reports on the on the web page um, under the global OE index tab on our website, and the reports were published in 2019, 2021, and 2023. And uh, then you can take a look at a, a high level uh, version of the assessment instrument in Appendix Three of the publication. That's all laid out there. And then on that global OE index web page. There are the links to uh, the assessment instrument that we use uh, so that you can go there and, you know, experience it uh, yourself. But people do like to take a look at the high level overview of it. And uh, and that's where you can find that in, a, in Appendix 3 is kind of <laughs> on paper, you know, so to speak. You'll get an explanation of the rating scales and the principles and the practices. And uh, and you've got a, you know, bird's eye view of it. Yes. Well, what we will do uh, is commit to providing those links with the send out of the uh, the recording. And maybe, you know, uh, if there are further questions, you can pose those um, to either Dawn or myself at OES or the CCOE. And we would be happy to see how best we can address those. But with that, I want to say thanks again, uh, Don, for an excellent presentation. And the work you've been doing is highly commendable. We appreciate it. Thanks for sharing this with us. And to your audience, we say thank you for joining us. And do have yourselves an excellent afternoon. Take care now. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. Take care now.